Welcome to the Language and Imagery of Cancer. Now, today's session, it's been an interesting one. Um, when we were given the title, there's many different ways with, that we can explore it. Obviously, the, the word cancer is, is very emotive and uh, brings up quite a lot of interesting challenges for us. In terms of language and imagery, we found ourselves uh, often finding different avenues and different ways of exploring it. So today is very much um, a, an open session for you guys to, to explore this, this concept with us. So an idea. What are we talking about when we're talking about an idea? We're talking about this idea of cancer. We're talking about how we talk about it. We're talking about the stories. We're talking about how we portray cancer. Today we want to try and flip what we think about cancer on its head a little bit. We want to tame it. You guys are creative and we want to try and tame it together with you. Now, cancer is a difficult one, isn't it? We all have our own sort of story. One in two of us will come against it. We'll either be diagnosed or we'll know a family member or a friend that gets diagnosed with it. <clears throat> so today we're going to try and take apart this idea of cancer. We're going to try and look at it from various different angles and, and maybe explore whether we can start having a, a different conversation around cancer, whether we can turn it on its head somewhat. Can we tame cancer? First of all, we're going to look at the meaning of cancer. Where's it come from? A little bit of a history lesson. Then we're going to have a look at, can we flip the idea of cancer? Can we turn it from the antagonist to a protagonist? What's its story? Who is cancer? Can we turn it into a character? Can we turn it into something that perhaps when we're discussing cancer, perhaps when we're having conversations around cancer, somehow it's not as evil as we thought it was. Maybe together we can explore that idea a little bit further. The big C. Why do we have this preconception about cancer? Obviously we have this death thing, but also there are fundamentals that we have been told for years and years around cancer. We're talking euphemism, we're talking all of these different ways about it. We're going to explore that a little bit further as well. And then eventually, hopefully, if we take it apart, deconstruct it, think about it slightly differently, can we flip the script? Can we turn it on its head and start to understand it a little bit more? So as I said, we all have our own interactions with cancer. This is Anne Harrison. Anne Harrison was diagnosed with um, with cancer um, in 1995. Um, it was a pretty pretty horrible cancer um, and she had 18 months with it. It was pancreatic cancer, one of the real bad ones. Uh, 18 months passed and it took a life. She was 39 years old. Yeah, that's, that's me. That's me in that picture. Recently, this is Mo Sloan. Mo Sloan is, is my mother-in-law. Um, she was diagnosed with uh, melanoma. She was born and raised in Africa and obviously a lot of sun had, had given her this cancer. What started off as a small black dot on the end of her nose. I'd seen her go to the D GP many, many times and the GP had just passed it off and said it's uh, simple rosacea. It's nothing to worry about. Months and months and months went by until, as you can see, she had to have this first operation. And what happened was they removed the cancer from the end of her nose, they pieced it up from a bit of her ear. This was her after the operation. This was actually the day before her second operation because in this first operation they didn't get all of the cancer. Second operation they managed to do everything they could because they were doing biopsies. So they took a little bit, they tested it, took a little bit more, tested it. And actually, what happened was they, originally we were going to have this um, skin flap. So there was this talk of quite a disfiguring operation, really. But actually, what happened was, was really good. They got it in the second sort of pass, and she looks fine and well. So, you know, these are just two personal stories from my perspective that show the different ways that cancer is dealt with and portrayed, okay? Now, as I said, we all have our own stories, don't we? We all understand how cancer is and we all have our preconceptions. So first, today, what I'd like us to do is you all have a post-it note on, in front of you. So what I'd like you to do is the very first thing, the very first thing that comes into your mind about cancer, go, write it down. 
once you've written it down, come and stick it on this board up here. See what we got, see what we got. Lot of death, lot of death. Uh, okay, yeah, we've got some personal stuff up there. Yeah, okay, non-judgmental, end of the world. Oops, a few more. Deterioration, death, 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 scary. Suffering, family, gutted, death, end of the world. Right, forget about it. Just forget about it. Let's leave it there, all right? Because we're trying to do something a bit different today. That's our kind of personal stuff, but here's what we do. We're a communications agency, right? We have to tell these stories. We have to talk differently about this stuff. Because we're going to learn as we go forward with today's session that actually it doesn't always mean death. Cancer is a big thing, right? It's a, it's a big story and it's worth exploring. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ben, who's going to give us a little bit of a history of cancer. So, cancer as an entity, as a thing, as an idea, pretty much goes back to as long as life on this earth goes back. We don't actually have any specific evidence from the start of life on earth that some of these beings were cancerous, but in a way we kind of do, and I'm going to explain why in a, a bit later on. The earliest example we have of cancer affecting an organism is a dinosaur. Uh, this is kind of some cellular and cartilage tissue from a dinosaur. They found it actually in the bone of a hydrosaur, that's thought, which is thought to be about 70 million years old. So what we do know and we have evidence of is this has been affecting organisms and potentially killing organisms for at least 70 million years probably way, way, way longer than that. The earliest example we have of it in a human is from this, which is a, a script from ancient Egypt about 1500, 2000 BC. It was written by a doctor named Imhotep, uh, an Egyptian physician, and in it is details of any number of diseases and his ways to treat these. And in one of them, he describes breast cancer, actually in a male, and he described it as tumours with prominent heads and have produced cysts of pus in a man's breast. And he described cancer as being non-curable. Although in one case he had tried cauterization with a fire stick. This basically means he got a stick, got it red hot at the end and just poked the guy with it. And then we fast forward about a thousand years to ancient Greece and Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. And he was performing autopsies on dead bodies, and when he saw a tumour, he saw loads of veins and blood vessels coming out of that tumour. And he said, that kind of looks like a crab. So he named it Carcinos, the Greek for crab, which was later translated into the Latin cancer. And I think partly that just shows the power of language. This word, this word cancer, all stems from the fact that one guy once was like, huh, that looks like a crab. I'm going to call it crab for now, I'll probably think of a better name later on. And that was 500 BC. So two and a half thousand years later, and that word has become this huge thing. It's almost mutated beyond control in a way. Then if we go forward another few hundred years to about 100 AD, there was a Roman doctor called Galen, and he was the first person to surgically remove tumours. And he was the one who used the words, word onkos, meaning swelling in Latin, which is where oncology derives from. Uh, for his treatment of cancer, he described it as only being cur curable at commencement. So you had to catch it really early. And then his description of removing, again, breast cancer was, the incision continues, cutting in depth and burning the incised tissues, continuing this procedure for as long as necessary. And this is before any sort of anaesthetic. The language that is being used here is very aggressive. It's very militant. It's very cut, burn, cauterize, surgery. It basically screams of panic. They had no idea what they were dealing with and they could only think of cutting it out and, as I said, for as long as necessary. And then we fast forward again. We're now at about 1650 and the scientist Robert Hooke has just has used one of the very earliest microscopes to look at an onion and he's seen that they're made up of lots of little bits, which he calls cells which he names after a small room, Greek cellar. And he starts to put forward the idea that all organisms are made of these tiny cells, each about a tenth to a hundredth of a millimetre in size. And then they start to say, well, maybe cancer is made of these things as well. Maybe it's not just every organism. And this actually split, split 
the scientific community somewhat? Because some people were like, no, absolutely not. There's no way that these kind of pathological aggressive cells could exist in kind of the purity of the human body. And other people were saying, well, if all living things are made from it, then it, they probably are as well. And it was about 200 years this debate raged on until microscopes got better and they could actually start to look at cells in more detail and they found that cancer is in fact made of cells in the same way. The treatments at the time, all the, all the way through the Middle Ages, were um, surgery, as we've said, bloodletting, or laxatives. Some of these were more effective than others, it's fair to say. Until the early 1900s, and that was all we had for, for the next several hundred years, till the early 1900s. Anyone know who these are? Marie Curie. Marie Curie and her lesser known husband, Pierre Curie. They won the Nobel Prize in the early 1900s for discovering radiation, and then Marie Curie went on after her husband died to discover the elements radium and polonium. And these were seen as like miracle cures for all sorts of things. They just seemed to be brilliant at everything. And one thing they did is they caused tumours to shrink. They kind of burnt away tumours. Marie Curie would actually, they didn't know the dangers of radiation. Uh, one thing she would do at dinner parties was put her hands in a kind of radium water bath and then just run around the room with glowing green hands. Um, she did then die of cancer, caused by the radiation poisoning. But the other thing that happened this time, basically what happened, they, they found finally there was a new treatment. There wasn't just surgery, there was something new. There was this radiation, which is uh, advanced into radiotherapy. So the language suddenly changes. Instead of being angry and militant as it was for so long, it becomes one of hope. It, we see these adverts, cancer can be cured. I will give you a thousand dollars if I fail to cure any cancer. There was this new hope in the world of cancer treatment that there was now something could be done. And this only extended into the 1930s when chemotherapy was discovered, which is derived from mustard gas. And when chemotherapy came along, they were like, for thousands of years we've had nothing, or well, just surgery. Now we've got surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And they actually had to bring a law in. It's probably the first uh, pharma advertising regulation law, the National uh, Cancer Act in 1939, which said, made it illegal to falsely advertise cancer treatments. And actually, this law is still in force today, and there was someone in November last year who got sentenced. I think he got two years in prison because he was claiming that he could cure cancer over the internet using Skype, using techniques he learned from Alpha Centauri when he was taken there by an alien spaceship. And really, from a, from a treatment perspective, this is what Ben Harmon Jones was saying in the Lynx Academy. You've got three things to do. You can cut it out with surgery, you can burn it with radiology, and you can poison it with chemotherapy. So we've not had another one come along. All of these have got so much better in the last 100 years. But we've kind of stuck there and we've almost, and we're going to touch on the language that we now use later on. But in order to get a deeper insight into what these are all trying to, these treatments are all trying to do and, what, um, and deal with, we need to understand a bit more about who cancer is, about the character that sits behind all these stories and these treatments. And that's what we're now going to, talk about here. Right, so who is cancer? We all have this preconception about cancer, don't we? Everybody's looking really glum. It's, it's all right, it's all right, we're going to get happy. It's, it's a shit thing, we know it's a shit thing, but let's try and, we've parked all of that, let's, let's try and <coughs> build it up a bit. So who is this cancer? If we're to try and make it a character, who, who is it? Well, it's a, a thing that's been portrayed for time of memoriam in, in what we do, you saw there the start of advertising, you started to see people talking about it a little bit more when we have mass communications. A lot of these films, who's seen some of these films? We've probably seen one or two. Yeah, anyone? No? Okay, right. So interestingly, what we see is from the 80s, you know, we have all these sort of films, this one late 80s. They're all talking about this, this end of life stuff, aren't they? They're all talking about readdressing the things that we did wrong or trying to get everything done in our life. They're all very, very cataclysmic events that we're exploring. Now, we could say that that's because they put bums on seats. You know, they do sell tickets. People like this emotional journey. People connect to them in some way because it's emotional. But is that the story that is true today, is everything that we know about cancer. We've already started to see, you know, my mother-in-law, for instance, she's a survivor, we see survivors all the time. We start to see stories like this emerging now, don't we? Me and a girl, and uh, me and Earl and the dying girl, these are, these are modern takes on 
the cancer story. They're essentially the same kind of thing, the same sort of trope as what we've always had. But this is where our understanding and our connectivity to the story of cancer often lies. As a communications agency, you know, this is the kind of world view that we're working into. Now, obviously, today we have more opportunity to tell our own stories. We have YouTube, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have all the social channels that we talk on. So our stories get more personal, our stories get more true and honest. Because what we see all the time is this human story. What we tell all the time is this human story, because that's how we tell our stories. We tell it through our understanding of other people and what they go through. Now remember, if we look at this subjectively, that is the treatment that's causing that. That is the treatment that's causing them to lose their hair. So let's try again, park what we think we know, and let's try and take a different lens on cancer. Let's look at some numbers. So these show five-year survival rates for some of the most common cancers in the mid-70s versus the mid-2000s. And the good news is pretty much every arrow points that way. Treatments are getting better, diagnosis is getting better, and it's just everything is getting more positive. We've got things up here. Prostate cancer now has a 99.3% survival rate. And if you've got prostate cancer and you go and tell your friends, I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, the initial reaction you get is one of, you might die. It's like you've told them I've got a terminal illness. But 90, and for one, one in 100 people, that might be true. But for 99 in 100 people, that's just not true. It, may, it no longer needs to be viewed as this terminal illness. And then we've got skin cancer, breast cancer, all up in the 90s. Leuke some forms of leukemia are up in the 90s too. So that's all a positive story. The problem is if you actually look at what cancers these are, prostate, skin, breast, uterus, bladder, these are all places that are either easy to access, easy to access with surgery, or they're organs that you can live without if the whole thing is removed. If you have bladder cancer, for example, one of the treatments is just to remove the bladder. You have to live with a bag for the rest of your life, but you're not going to have the cancer because you've taken it out completely. It's when we get down here to the really nasty ones like pancreas and liver and lung. These are the places that are very difficult to access with surgery. They're hidden right within the body. Brain, I mean, the hardest organ in the body to operate on. We're still, survival statistics are still dictated largely by whether or not we can do surgery on it. And that's, in order to get these numbers up to here where we want them, we need another option. I think there's a, there's a few points I'd like to make on this slide, actually. It's so interestingly up here, if we start to look at prostate and we start to look at breast and we start to look at some of these, these cancers up here, you think about the posters and you think about the content that we see all the time for you know, motivating people to get tested. And we're talking a lot here about the capability of science to understand a little bit more about pre-cancers, about, you know, identifying when it becomes a problem. What do people think about this? I'm still seeing lots of dour faces here, but this is a, this should be a positive story. Now, I get it, you know, I'm, I'm from down here too, but on the whole, what we are seeing is science tackling this problem. You know, we are starting to see new ways of dealing with this. Does everybody agree that this is a a more positive spin, I think you'll see that actually, you know, some people that you talk to, they're going to survive it. Where that positivity is from the treatments is not that yet, yet there in the language at all, or in the conceptions of it, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to, to flip that and think of a more modern, more positive way of speaking about this. And one of the things that's really going to fuel this positivity is immuno-oncology which you've all heard quite a bit about, so I'm not going to go into it too much and spend too much time on it. Essentially, what this is, is getting your immune cells, these little guys, killing the cancer cells. It's turning the immune system onto the cancer. The way it does this is cancer at the moment is able to kind of, because it comes from our own cells, which I'm going to touch on a bit in the next section, it's able to hide from the immune system. The immune system is great at attacking foreign things, viruses, bacteria, thing that, things that aren't part of the human body but cancer comes from the human body. So it hides, it masks itself. It actually is able to switch off some of the immune cells that come in. And immunotherapy is all about either shining bright lights on the tumor to the immune, immune system and say, look, there it is, go fight it. Or it's about turning these immune cells back on. 
and it might be that we can use those kind of together, turn the immune cells on up to max and shine a bright light with where they need to attack. We're hearing almost every other week now there's a story of somebody with stage four metastatic cancer that's spread all over the body and we're given no hope and with one of these new immunotherapies they're able to recover. And we're going to get more and more positive stories about that as the pipeline of these drugs in, uh, expands. But first of all, we're about to get you thinking about the character of cancer, but first of all, I really want to give you an appreciation for actually who this is, what this is and where it comes from. So to understand what cancer is, we need to go right the way back to the beginning of life on this planet. About 3.8 billion years ago, the first cells formed. And they formed for a single purpose, to preserve DNA. DNA formed by these uh, elements spontaneously coming together, forming genetic information that made a set of instructions. And one of these instructions said, build me a survival machine. Build me something that preserves myself. So it built a cell to hide itself in, a little cage, a small room, if you will. And then it said, well, now what I want to do is replicate and pass on my information to the next generation. So cells started to do this. They started to divide. Now, in order for a cell to divide, it has to replicate every single piece of DNA in its body. Does anyone know what DNA actually is? It's your body's building box. It's a set of instructions. It's actually a code. It's a set of letters. There are three billion letters in every one of your cells. If you wanted to copy three billion letters, if I asked you to go and type that out now, if you could type at one letter every second, it would take you 32 years with no breaks. The cell can do it in one hour. It replicates that entire set of instructions in one hour, splits into two cells. And every now and then it makes a mistake. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? I think we can forgive it that, can't we? I mean, oh, it's got a lot to do, right? If you look at statistics, it should make a mistake every 10,000 letters. And out of 10 billion, that would be, well, sorry, out of 3 billion, that would be hundreds of thousands of mistakes it's making every time. And it just, and it doesn't, until every now and then it makes one. And actually, those mistakes are brilliant. Those mistakes are what made life on this earth what it is. Those mistakes are what gave one cell an advantage over others and allowed it to go in a certain direction. Maybe it made a few cells come together. They formed a multi multicellular organism, a survival machine that was even better at protecting that DNA and making sure it gets passed on to the next generation. Maybe a few more came together. Eventually, they formed the first animals. One of those animals, a mistake was made and its neck got a bit longer. And then that passed that on to future generations because it was a better at surviving than the others. And then we got giraffes. Some of them had a trunk and then we got elephants. Some of them develop the ability to communicate with each other and form language. And a lot of people say that's what separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom is the evolution of language. All of which comes from mistakes that these little guys made every time they replicated. So that is a really good thing. But now I want to stop thinking, I want you to stop thinking of yourself as one person. All you are, from a biology perspective, is an ecosystem for, on which your cells can live. You are your own little universe. Does anyone know how many cells there are in the average human body? The most recent estimate we have is 37 trillion of these making you. 37 trillion individual living pieces all functioning together to form you to make sure their genetic information gets to the next generation because they've designed you to be the best possible outcome, best po possible route they have at surviving. And they have to divide in your body at all, all times. Your skin is continually being replaced by new cells. Your whole blood supply is replaced every three months. So it's no surprise that while they're undergoing this process of division and replication, that mistakes are made. In this ecosystem that you call your body, every now and then, one cell gets a bit of an advantage. It's a bit better at surviving. It lives a bit longer. It grows a bit faster. It replicates more. As it replicates more, more and more of these mutations come in that make it even stronger, even better at surviving. It didn't ask for these mutations to happen. It didn't go out aiming to hurt the body at which it's part of. They just happened, they're spontaneous. And that is all cancer is. It's evolution happening at an incredibly quick rate, turned up to the max, happening inside your own body. The result is you get this, super, this, this collection of super cells. They're stronger, they're faster, they live longer than the rest of the cells in your body. Like the giraffe with a longer neck, they out-survive its competitors in the body. 
they start to take nutrients away from them and fuel themselves. Maybe they get a bit arrogant. They think, I've conquered this zone, I'm going to go and explore the rest of the body, see what I can do over there. Maybe they get a bit greedy, they take more than they should, they start to bite the hand that feeds it, because really it's not in their interest to kill the body, because you kill the body, you kill the tumour. If you start to think of it as a, some people like to think of it as a bit of a parasite for this reason. Parasites are dependent on their host. And really, a good parasite won't kill its host, but cancer does. So maybe it's a bit stupid. But it's also very sly, very intelligent, because it hides from the immune system, it cloaks itself, it turns the immune system off. It's a bit sneaky like that. Maybe it's just misunderstood. It didn't ask for this, it didn't ask for this power. It's just been given it spontaneously. There are so many characteristics that you could apply to this, simply for the reasons of how it came into being. This is a fundamental, right? This is, this is the bit when myself and Ben were talking about this. This is the bit where my head starts going, okay, so I just want to, I've always talked about cancer and cutting it out. It's, a, it's, a, it's an invader, it's a, it's a thing that shouldn't be here. But actually, when you start to think about it, it it's just us. It's just a, a little bit of a malformed us inside, all right? We know it's got repercussions, but if we start to think about it as us, how would we talk to it? How would we envisage it? How would we see it? Rather than being this horrible story that we've all seen there, being all of this, how would we take that and, and start to think about, okay, how do I understand you? To understand a thing, to know a thing, then we can have an opportunity to, to maybe talk about it differently. We can maybe tackle it differently. So already, hopefully, you're starting to see that actually, maybe it's not what I thought it was. Maybe it is just this little thing that's misunderstood. Maybe it is this little, I don't know, little entity that, that just went wrong somewhere. When I start to think of it like that, I do start to think, okay, well, maybe we've got some opportunity here to have a better conversation around it. Something that instantly doesn't make me fearful. Something that instantly doesn't make me terrified of the, the repercussions. This is where the idea came from for today, really, is this idea that, okay, we know that we're tackling it, we know that we're getting on top of it, we know that we're, we're winning. How can, we, how can we tell that story differently? As a communications agency, as creatives, how can we tell that story differently? So what we want to do is just explore a little bit around the language of how we talk about cancer. The big C. Interestingly, we started to do some research and tried to find where this originated from. It's, it's quite a difficult one to find the, the actual source of where the big C was first used. It's, what we use the big C for is obviously a euphemism. When we have those challenging conversations, we always talk about it as the big C. We always hide behind this big C. But interestingly, the, the language that we use is not always euphemistically around cancer. It's this kind of thing. We're bombarded with it every day, aren't we? The war on cancer the battle, the, the, you know, the enemy, all of this, why, why you know, cancer is a, a war, fight, battle. This is the sort of language that we're always coming up against, isn't it? We see it every day. Brave. You know, all of these kind of words are what we try and personify cancer with now. That's how we talk about it. And actually, for some people, some people really respond well to this, we've seen. When you read testimonies from patients and watch videos and stuff, like that top right one says, I decided to describe it as a battle, but that doesn't mean anyone else should. And there's some people who say, it's absolutely not a fight or a battle, I don't feel brave, I don't feel like I'm fighting. But the problem we have at the moment is there's no other option really. It's, it's this or nothing, it's this or we have no way of talking about it. And that's something that we need to begin to address, and people are starting to address. In the industry that we work in, this is the kind of stuff that we produce, this is the kind of stuff that we are in the business of doing. This one here, the smug deserve to die, trying to grab onto this idea of stigma around lung cancer. It also talks about hipsters deserve to die. On this one over here, we will rally together. We will group together and, and try and fight this. We'll beat this war. We'll defeat this object, this cancer. We'll beat cancer sooner. So interestingly, this is the kinds of story and language and visuals that we're absolutely every day accustomed to seeing. Is this the right story for us to be telling these days? 
Is it something else that we need to explore when we look at the, the science and when we look at the statistics of, of actually what it means to have cancer? If it's a chronic disease, if it's something different to what we first thought it was years and years ago, is this the opportunity now for us to explore different ways of talking around it? Perhaps? I mean, this is no different, really, to the language that was being used uh, when I read you the line from the Edwin Smith papyrus, the one from ancient Egypt, and it was aggressive, fighting language. And then we moved away from that a bit, the treatments got better, but now, because we've been waiting so long for something new to come, we've reverted back to that angry, fighting military language, and basically it smacks of a lack of understanding, it smacks of panic, and it shows that we don't appreciate cancer for what it is, we don't understand it fundamentally, which actually we now kind of do much more, but the language has not caught up with the science in that respect. And that's what we, can, we have the ability to do as a communications agent. Do we know where this, this idea came from, this, this war on cancer? It's actually a political one. So in the 70s, um, Nixon declared a war on cancer. He signed a, a cancer, cancer act. Um, it was in 1971. What was interesting is we had the Apollo missions and we had uh, treatments for polio vaccines and things like that that were coming onto the market. And we saw cancer as this thing that we could just find a cure for. You know, that's why it became a war. In a war, we have good guys and bad guys. We have a common enemy. We have a simple enemy that we can just defeat overnight or with the right tools, with the right weapons, essentially. But the scientists of the time, this guy, Sol Spiegelman, they knew that this wasn't the case. Sol Spiegelman was doing lots of research in DNA and RNA. He was a cancer researcher. He was discovering that actually this conversation that we're having about cancer, it's not a war. It's a diplomatic conversation that we should be having. Certainly now as we move forward, you know, we are looking at the language of diplomacy because we know more about the science. We know more about the things that actually create these cancers. He said at the time, which was very brave of him going against Nixon, but he said, look, we, talking about cancer as a war is like us landing on the moon without understanding the physics of Newton. We're just giving a broad brush to this and just saying, we will fight this, we will defeat this, we will find a cure. He knew full well that it was a lot harder to do than the, what the society was, was actually painting it as. So where are we now? As we've said, lots of people are telling their own stories. Lots of people are tackling these preconceptions that we have about cancer. Has anybody seen these? I, I do see these appear quite a lot in, in, uh, in presentations. So this is from Emily McDowell. Emily McDowell was 24 and she was diagnosed with stage 3 Hodgkin's lymphoma. She was sick of the conversations and the, the euphemisms and the descriptions and the way that people were talking to her and she told it how it was. My favourite, I think most people's favourite is this one, when life gives you lemons I won't tell you a story about my cousin's friend who died of lemons. We can be honest, we can be frank, everybody has their own story Everybody has their own ways of coping with things. We all do in this room, whether it affected us personally or whether we know somebody that it has affected. Humour is becoming one of those interesting sort of explore, explorations of this. We talk about dark humour, we talk about gallows humour, and you know, even that previous exercise that we did, it was such a challenge overcoming that, that first hurdle. I hate this fucker, I hate this thing. It's taking people away from me. But already, you know, I'm, st I'm starting to see people just line up a little bit when we came back in the room. Just, just that little bit of personification, that little bit of a giving it a name, giving it a thing. People start to lighten around it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.